invite you to open a Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along in the bulletin or you can grab one of the few Bibles in front of you and open that up to Ephesians chapter 2. There's also an insert in your bulletin that has the reading for you. And the reason for that is to try something a little different this morning. I get asked quite frequently, and I don't know the reasoning behind it, but I get asked quite frequently, how do I come up with sermons? So that's either a really comforting, encouraging question of like, wow, we can't understand how you come up with something so amazing, or it's, what are you doing during the week? So either or, right? So what I want to do this morning, because as we go through the first three chapters of Ephesians, one of the big themes that I keep emphasizing, that Paul emphasizes in these texts, is that it's all about God's grace. And in the first three chapters of Ephesians, there's not a single command for us to do. There's not an imperative. There's not a command. There's not Paul saying, and you need to be doing this. All he's talking about is the wonderful, amazing grace of God in Christ Jesus for you and me, no matter who we are, no matter what our sins are, no matter what our background is, no matter how close we feel to God or not that it's all about his grace in Jesus. And that the thing about Paul is that he loves to use really big words. All right, even Peter in one of his letters says, I've read some of Paul's letters and I'm confused. And that's the apostle Peter who wrote books of the Bible. So if you've ever looked at some of Paul's letters in your Bible and been like, this sounds really nice, but I don't get it totally, or you're a little confused, you're just like Peter. And that's okay. So this morning, what I want to do is to show you a little bit of how to walk through a Bible text, right? How to, how to break it down and understand what it means for us as followers of Jesus. So this passage is one of the most famous passages ever within the Lutheran church. So if you grew up Lutheran or you've been Lutheran for a while, you have heard this passage before, especially verses 8 and 9. I met a lot of people by the time I was a pastor who make those their confirmation verses or they love those verses and they say, see, this is what it's all about. It's all about God's grace. And it's true and it's wonderful. But there's a whole chapter around those two verses. So what I want to do this morning as we go through the text is show you a few things. So the first thing I want to show you is why we actually need grace. So we talk about grace a lot, especially as Lutherans. We talk about grace a lot, especially as Christians, that we we talk about the amazing grace of Jesus. Oh, it's all about God's grace that saves us and redeems us. But we often don't talk about why we actually need grace and why other people throughout the world actually need God's grace. And the reason we don't talk about our need for it is because It is so foreign to the way the world works and the way our natural instincts work as humans. Our biggest desire as human beings is to like earn it for ourselves, right? To do it my way, to be the best, to say I don't need any help. How many of you like helping other people, right? You have a generous spirit, someone, a friend, a family member needs help, and you're like, I am there for you. How many of you and the same person you absolutely hate asking for help. Why? We love to give out grace, right? We love to say, I will be there for you. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. And then as soon as you're in need of help, guess what you don't want? Grace from other people. Why? Because it's foreign to our nature. We want to reject it. Because we want to be able to say, I have no weaknesses. I can do it myself. I am strong enough. I am smart enough. I am wise enough. Even if I got myself into this mess, I'm good enough to dig myself up out of it, right? And to ask anybody else for help means what? You're weak or you're imperfect or you messed up. And how many of you walk around every week going, boy, I can't wait to go back to the office and tell everybody how messed up and imperfect and weak I am. Anybody putting that on your resume during an interview? Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm imperfect and I'm weak and I mess up all the time. You're hired. No, we always want to present ourselves as not needing grace. 
Now, the, the rebuttal is going to be, but pastor, we're Christians. We're, we're good Lutherans. Of course we love grace. We only love a part of it normally. We think, I, oh yeah, I need God's grace, but not as much as somebody else, right? I need God's grace, but it's only in a few areas of my life. The rest of it, I can take care of it. And what Paul's going to do in the opening verses of chapter 2 is completely destroy that way of thinking. That the way of thinking is we think we need grace for just a portion of our lives or a portion of our salvation or a portion of whatever area in our life is a little imperfect, but the rest we can handle. And what Paul's going to point out is that you and I need grace for all of it. So in verse 1, he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. All right? And later on, he's going to say it again, that you and I were dead. So here's what Paul is saying. Here's why you and I need grace. Because we are dead without it. We are dead in our sin. Now here's the deal. We want to fight against that and say, I'm actually a good person, right? I'm actually doing all right. I'm I'm not that bad off. I I only need a little bit of grace because look at all the good stuff I've done in my life. How many people, maybe you don't want to admit it, but we hear it all the time, everybody is essentially good, right? Anybody heard that sentiment? But we would believe it. And all the people that say that lock their doors at night. Why? Well, there's bad people out there. Why well, you just said everybody's good? No, well, some, you know what I mean. Some people are good. I'm good. But then the rest of you, not so much. So I'm going to lock my doors. Right? So what we do is we, we want to rebel against this way of thinking and think, no, I only need a little bit of God's grace because I'm pretty good. Another way of saying it is, I deserve his love. I deserve his goodness. I deserve his kindness. He owes it to me. Because look what I've done. I've strived so hard. I've worked so hard. I've served so much. I've been so good. He owes me a little bit. Of course he's going to give me grace. But what does Paul say? He doesn't say you're weak. He doesn't say you're just struggling a little bit. He doesn't say you were, you know, not trying harder, but if you try a little bit harder, what does Paul say? You were what? Dead. (laughs) Right? So if you're following along, here's what I do in my little weird brain. You circle that word. You're dead. That's the whole reason you and I need grace is because without it, we're dead in our sins. Paul doesn't say... Oh, you're just a little weaker, and you need to get a little stronger. It doesn't say, well, you've done some bad things, now just do a few more good ones to make up for it. Now he says you're completely dead. The reason he uses this word is he's trying to be as blunt as he possibly can. Because if you've ever lost a loved one, you've ever been to a funeral, you know that dead people don't do anything. They can't do anything. It's impossible. And that bluntness is what Paul is doing for you and I spiritually saying, this is what you are like spiritually because of sin. You are completely dead. You are completely helpless. And your only hope is resurrection. Your only hope is God's grace giving you new life. And to drive it further home, he goes on, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So what Paul is doing is he's helping us as Christians to learn to be humble and how we treat other human beings. Because what is your status? I'm dead in my own sin. And then Paul goes on, in the sins that you walked in, meaning you didn't just accidentally do them, you 
walked right into him going, this is a great idea, even though it's a terrible idea, but you thought it was good at the time. So you barged down that door and you said, here I am. And then he goes on and he says, and you're carrying out the desires of the flesh and of the body and of the mind. So if you circle those words or underline them or highlight them, he's talking about how we naturally behave as human beings. And you're like, those are weird words. So here's how you put them into our current language. You do whatever feels good. That's the passions of the flesh. It feels good, it feels right, I'm gonna go do it. Carrying out the desires of the body, right? Whatever gives me pleasure, whatever makes me happy, and then the pleasures of the mind, right? So how many of you have ever heard the advice, listen to your heart? You've given that advice. Stop giving that advice. It's terrible advice. Listen to your heart. Or we ask ourselves, what does your gut tell you? That's exactly what Paul's talking about. Do whatever feels good, whatever gives you pleasure, whatever you think is best, whatever your heart is telling you to do, You went and you did it. And what it led to is a bunch of selfishness and a bunch of sin. Because if I'm the driving force, if I'm the guide for the path that I walk down, guess what that means? It means I'm gonna make myself God. I'm gonna make myself the most important person in the whole universe. Because I want what I want. I want to enjoy what I want to enjoy. And so Paul is saying, you're doing all this, and here's one of the key phrases in verse three, like the rest of mankind. So before you, as a Christian, run out into the world and make a bunch of social media posts and yell at people in the parking lot of the grocery store to get their act together, to behave better, to stop doing that because you think you're so much better. Paul says, you did it just like everybody else. You're dead in your sin. You're following your own heart and own selfish desires. Just like who? All the people you want to think you are better than. So you and I need grace. Because just like everybody else, we're dead in our sins, we are set in our ways, and our only hope is that we are resurrected and given a new life and a new path to walk on. And then Paul gets to verse four. It's the big transition. Those first three verses are not fun, y'all. Like You're not supposed to walk away from those first three verses going, wonderful pep talk. I feel so much better about myself for the rest of the week. Right? No, Paul is telling you, you're, you're awful. You're dead in your sins. You're not amazing. You're not as awesome as you think you are. You're not actually better than everybody else. He's saying you're just like every other sinner that you look down upon and judge. And but in verse four is the transition into what is so wonderful and amazing about Christianity, which is God himself. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. So the the driving force for God's grace is not you, right? You were not mentioned in verse 4. God is the driving force for God's grace. The motivation for God's grace in your life is the fact that our God is rich in mercy, he's abundant in love, and he's giving his love to you in Jesus Christ. So it's not because you did a bunch of awesome things and God was so impressed with you. He was like, and now I love you. In fact, the amazing good news of God's grace is that verses one through three are absolutely true for you and I. We are sinners just like everybody else. We are so sinful, we are dead in our sin without any chance of rescuing ourselves. And yet God still showed mercy and love in Jesus for you and me. The beauty of God's grace is that it's actually for sinners. And it's for hypocrites. 
And it's for arrogant, judgmental Christians as well. Because it's for every single human being, no matter what our sin is, no matter what we're dead in. All right, verse five. Even when we were, what? Dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins. So if you're taking notes, you highlight that again because Paul's telling you for a reason, just in case you forgot, right? In case you have a short memory and you, you got to verse four and you forgot how terrible you were. You're like, oh no, God actually loves me. Oh, that's right, He's, he loves me because I'm amazing. Verse five, no, stupid, he loves you because you're dead in your trespasses. He loves you despite of you and your rebellion and your sin. And this is the beauty of God's grace. Here's what he does for us. We are what? Dead in our sins and trespasses. So what does God's grace do in our life? It makes us alive together with Christ. So the why you and I need grace is because we are dead in sin. So the first thing of what grace does, there's three things that grace does in our lives according to Paul here. So the first one is that it it raises you up to life in Christ. It gives you resurrection. Now that's also a future bodily resurrection when Christ returns and makes things all right and good again. But Paul's also talking about here and now. So here's what this looks like. You and I are dead in our sin. You're like, what does that mean? Anybody ever felt guilty? And I don't just mean like you felt like a little bad, but I mean like the kind of guilt that kept you up at night. Anybody? No one wants to raise their hand. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You're human beings, I'm assuming, because you're dead in your trespasses. You've felt guilty at times, right? Or maybe you've just felt shame. What do those do to you? They feel like death, right? They, they take away your sleep, they take away your appetite, they take away your joy, they ruin your relationships, they wreck your life. And what is Paul saying? Well, here's what God's grace does with you and your sin and your guilt and your shame and your feeling like that. He raises you to a new life. He gives you a resurrection. He raises you up out of the guilt and shame and says, I've forgiven you for all of it. I've taken away all of your guilt and shame. I put it on the cross and killed it there. And so now he has given you a resurrection for here and now. Meaning I get to walk, I'm made alive with Jesus. So what defines me is my savior, not my sin. And this is one of the things that grace does for you and I. It gives us a resurrection every single day. Every time you and I come up short, we go, oh, no, but I have been forgiven. I'm alive in Christ. I'm not dead in my sins anymore. I'm not dead in my guilt and my shame anymore because I don't carry it anymore. It's on the cross. It's been destroyed. It's been killed off. And instead, this is who I am. I get to walk. I get to live with Jesus. By grace, you have been saved. This is the second half of verse 5. So just, again, Paul's emphasizing, you didn't do it yourself. And that's the good news. I often ask our congregation this question, probably getting tired of me asking it. But right, how many of you have made the same mistake more than once? Cool. Guess what that means? You already know you can't save yourself. He's like, I'm not going to do it again. That was really dumb. I'm better than that. Next week, oh, my gosh, I am dumber than I thought. Why? Because you did it over again, even though you said, guess what? I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to be wiser. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more, whatever it is, I'm going to do better. And Paul says, actually, no, there's something better for you than saving yourself. It's being saved by God's grace in Jesus, because that one doesn't fail. You know from experience that your own personal salvation fails every time. So Paul reminds us, no, you've been saved by God's grace in Christ Jesus, which is better because it doesn't fail. It doesn't ever come up short. Instead, it completely raises you from the dead and the depth of your sin into new life. The verse six, and he raises us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So again, he's emphasizing, you have new life 
in Jesus. Your place is not down in the depths and death of sin and guilt and shame. Your place, you have been seated with Christ right now, meaning that is your spot. That is your place. You are with Jesus even here and now. The second thing that grace does is that it humbles how we view others. So we're going to jump to verses 8 and 9. Very famous verses, many of you probably have memorized. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, if you've been like a lifelong Lutheran, you've heard that verse a million times, and you're like, praise the Lord, that's our motto, right? Like, we're going to make a slogan out of it. Now, here's what happens when we become so familiar with a verse or a phrase is you forget how big of a meaning it has. You just kind of go, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. It's good. It's nice. But I want you to think about how we naturally live, right? If you go back to verses 1 through 3, especially verse 3, among we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind like the rest of mankind, right? So naturally speaking, what do we want to do? Prove ourselves to be what? Better than other people, right? This is why you see so many people tearing each other down. It's a desire to be above you, to show you the world that I am better than this person or that person. I Look how amazing and awesome I am. And then Paul says, well, you've been saved by grace, not yourself. You were just as bad, if not worse, than the people you're judging, the people you're looking down upon. I can't believe they live that way, think that way, speak that way, vote that way. That's a wonderful divisive topic, right? How can they be like that? What has Paul said? You just, you're just like them. Why do you think you're better? Your sin is just as deadly. Your sin is just as evil and bad. The only reason you are with Jesus now is because of God's grace, not because you're like, I think I want to be a better person today. No, it's simply because God's grace came into your life and raised you up and said, here you are now. You're with Jesus. And so as Paul's big conclusion here is, this is how you were saved. Therefore, this is not your own doing. How many of you have said it's my own doing in the way you live? I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to work better. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to go to, I'm a pastor. And I hate telling people that. It's very weird. Okay, just leave me alone. All right. But when I'm out in public or at parties and everyone wants to introduce me, because like, I want to show my pastor off like I'm some like little circus party. All right, but it's always weird. <laughs> like, look what he can do. All right. <laughs> and people are like, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, oh man, I hate that question. Because as soon as I say I'm a pastor, you all get super duper weird on me. Like it's, it's, there's never a normal reaction. Nobody ever goes, oh, that's cool. <laughs> right, tell me more. Never get that. No one ever asks me, tell me more. Everybody always goes, oh, okay. And then they walk away. That's option one, just to walk away from me. Option two is they probably said a bad word earlier in their party, and they go, I'm so sorry I said that. <laughs> like, that's option two. Yeah, I'm telling y'all, people get really weird. <laughs> option three, you know, I haven't been to church in a while, but I've been thinking about going back. I'm like, you're a liar. You're only, <laughs> okay. I believe the first half, you haven't been to church in a while, you're totally lying to me right now about, I think I'm going back soon. No, you're not. You just feel weird because, right? So here's why I bring this up. We think I'm going to do better, right? I'm going to do it on my own. Maybe you are overcome with your guilt and shame. Maybe you, you've realized that the depths of your sin and your brokenness and, and the harm you've done. You say, I, I don't want to live like that anymore, right? I want to do better. And then even as Christians, we still fall back into that same way of thinking, I want to do better. 
So we start listing off all the things we think will please God and make him love us. And I'm going to read my Bible, pray more. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to, I'm going to serve. I'm going to help. I'm going to do all these things. But we forget what Paul is saying. It's not of your own doing. You've been saved by grace. Here's what that means. Read it again in verse 4. It's already done for you. You're not going to convince God to love you more because he's already rich in mercy and love towards you. He's already given it, all of his perfect love. He has given to you in Jesus, so you don't have to please him. You don't have to be like, I'm going to do better next time. Please give me a little more. He's saying he's already given it all to you. So you can just rest in his grace. And in verse 9, not a result of works so that no one may boast. It is very tempting, but we fall into these habits all the time, to tell everybody else, I am better than you. And however you do that, everybody's got their own standards, you've got your own list of people you think you're better than that you put down all the time. But grace sets us free to simply enjoy God's love for us. But it also sets you free to love other people well. Even the people you think you're better than. You're like, how is that possible? Because it says that no one may boast. See, that's the root of all of our judging of other human beings, all of our lack for other people that we think we're better than is we are boasting about ourselves. I don't struggle with that, therefore I'm better. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor, people have been talking about their sin and instead of wanting to just confess it and kill it and be forgiven, they tell me instead, but at least I don't do this. What are you doing at that moment? I am boasting that I'm better than you because I don't have your sin. Yeah, but you got your own, fool. That's what the first three verses are all about. Paul said, you walked in it just like everybody else. Maybe you just walked in a different one, but you still walked in it. And grace sets you free to stop having to prove yourselves to God and the rest of the world. When I stop having to prove myself to the rest of the world, I'm free to love them. Because the only thing I have to boast about and brag about and talk about is how rich in love and mercy and grace God is in Jesus Christ. And that's what grace does. It sets you free to enjoy it. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, good. It's not my own doing. It's all the doing of Jesus for me. It also means it's not their doing. It's all the doing of Jesus for them as well. So now, what I boast about and brag about is how amazing and beautiful and wonderful Jesus is. And when you get that as your mindset, you can love anyone. And here's the next verse, the one that, I grew up Lutheran. This is the one that Lutherans leave off all the time. We're like, God's grace is amazing, amen. There's a whole other verse. We're gonna look at it this morning. Verse 10, this is what, Grace does for us. This is the third thing if you're taking notes that grace does for us is it sustains our walk with Jesus. All right, and here's verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What he's saying is you were created for an amazing purpose. You were created for a higher and a better way of living and a better purpose than your own sinful, fleshly desires. Just listen to your heart, verse three and four, right? Instead, he's saying, no, God created you for a better thing. And that is to live a life with Jesus, to do good for the world, to help people to love them and to serve them. And the only way that you and I are gonna do this is by the grace of God. The only way you and I are gonna do it is because we have been raised to life with Jesus, we are walking with Jesus, we are living with Jesus, and therefore we go, oh, okay, I'm gonna follow his direction rather than my own. 
In the very last line, there's a word for you to circle, that we should walk in them. All right, so circle the word walk if you're taking notes because what was verse one all about? That you and I once walked what? In our sins. And now because of the grace of God that has redeemed you and rescued you and raised you to new life, you and I now walk where? In the footsteps of Jesus and the good works that he has laid out for us to do. Now before you run off, and say, oh, okay, cool, God loves me, let me go make sure he keeps loving me by doing good things, because that's not what Paul's saying. I want you to see that you and I keep doing this Christian life, walking with Jesus, sharing the grace of God with others, only because the grace of God continues to sustain you and me. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus has a wonderful sermon, and in verse 28 of Matthew 11, he says, to his people, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How many of you are familiar with that promise, right? It's a beautiful promise. Jesus saying, you come to me, you're, you're worn out, you're beat up, you're exhausted from the world, you come to me and I will what? I will take your burdens. I'm gonna give you rest. And we're like, oh, it's so beautiful. And it's so beautiful, we leave off verse 29. <laughs> right? We're like, that's good. That's good enough for me, Jesus. Just stop talking right there. But verse 29, he goes on, and he says, Take my yoke upon you, and what? Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, why does Jesus say this? He's talking about what walking with him in grace looks like. He's talking to you and me about what living with Jesus is in our daily lives looks like. And so he uses this word yoke, and what that meant in an agricultural society back then is the yoke was the thing that bound two oxen together as they would plow fields and do the work. And what they did, though, because they were smart after centuries of doing this, is they would often take an older ox who knew the rhythms of how to plow correctly and they would bind their yoke to a younger ox who hadn't learned the ways yet. Because what they found is the young ox would just like take off. <laughs> be like, oh, look how fast I'm going. It's amazing. Look how many good things I'm doing. And they would exhaust themselves before they finished the field. But the older ox who had been trained knew how to pace themselves to complete the work all the way. And so in order to teach the younger ox, what they would do is they would bind them together, put the yoke together, and the older one would set the pace and teach the younger one, here's how to do the work so you can actually finish the job. And what the rabbis did, and Jesus was a rabbi, what they did was they began to call their teaching, their way of living, a yoke. And they would say, you're going to place my yoke upon you, which meant you're going to walk with me. You're going to live with me. and You're going to follow me so closely that you're going to learn from me how to walk at my pace, how to live life the right way. Now, most of the world, by our human nature, operates like the young ox. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Go as fast as you can. Go as hard as you can. Do as much as you can quickly. Right? Anybody ever heard the phrase, hurry up and wait? You get all, you get, here we go, we're gonna, okay, what's next, right? It's the opposite of rest. So what does Jesus say? I want you to take my yoke upon you. I want you to, to come and learn from me. I want you to bind yourself to me. And here's what I'm going to teach you. He even says, I want you to learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in spirit, and you will find what? Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, when we put ourselves with Jesus, he's saying, I'm gonna teach you a whole new way to live, a way of life that is rooted in God's grace and mercy for you. So he says, my burden is easy, because you don't have to carry it. That's why it's easy. He's the one carrying it for you. When he says, my burden is light, 
He's not putting on a whole, onto you a whole new rule set that says do this and do that and then God will love you. He's saying, no, my burden and my yoke are easy and light because it's all based on grace. It's what Jesus is inviting you and I into is to receive God's grace, as Paul says, to, to be raised up alive with him and to spend our lives walking with him at his rhythms of rest and grace and learning what it means to live a grace-filled life so that you and I can complete the good works that he has laid out for us to do, so that you and I don't get exhausted and worn out trying to save ourselves, but instead we get to walk every single day, every single footstep in God's grace, knowing he already loves you. He has already accepted you. He has already rescued and saved you and redeemed you. And then here's our job as Christians. We simply tell people, do you want to walk with us in Jesus? Do do you want to walk in his grace? Do you want to walk in his mercy? Do you want to walk in his love? And always tell you, there's always room. (laughs) There's always more space for you. This is the invitation of Jesus. Is to say, stop walking in your sin, to stop walking in, I'm going to do it myself, stop walking in the attitude and the way of thinking that says, I'm going to save myself. Instead, we get to walk in his grace and his mercy and say, I'm going to walk in the way of Jesus, because the way of Jesus is easy and light on the soul, because he's done it all for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. We give thanks that you have done all of the work for us and that while we are dead in our sins, you raised us to new life with you and that by your grace, we get to live each and every day with you. Help us, Lord, to live in that grace and to rejoice in that grace. And most importantly, Lord, help us to share that grace with hurting people around the world. In your name we pray, amen.